Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church. Glad you made it out. Uh, I know if you were trying to catch the second half of the Vikings game, I had to give that up to get here, but that's okay. I won't give you any spoilers. I won't uh, tell you what the score is in case you're recording it and you want to be surprised later on. Uh, I happened to look just before I came in, but uh, nonetheless... Thank you for being here this morning. Well, it's a great day to praise the Lord, and we're going to sing, we're going to rejoice, we're going to make some joyful noises, we're going we're gonna to dig into the Word of God. But before we get going, I have a group of people I'd like to have come up and join me, if they would, for a minute. Uh, if you just join me right up here, if you were in the group of people who were baptized on, uh, it was August 28th, if you would come up, I have baptism certificates for you. So if you guys would all just come up here real quick, Justice, come on up. Third family, Peter, who else do we got? Come on up. Aurora, yes, there we go. All right, just stay here, hold those. And Matthew, Aurora, here's one for you, Aurora. And Peter. And come on in, come on in. Am I missing anybody out there? And we have Carly, and Leilani. Leilani's back. Oh, you're, you came up. I'm sorry. Okay. Leilani's usually uh, at this time back in the sound booth. I didn't realize she snuck up here. Noah. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Noah, Eli. No. Where's, Noah's not here. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, Miley. This one's yours, Eli. I'm sorry. And Adrian. There we go. All right, there's a few more I will get handed out. These are the folks who were baptized here back in August 28th. We were at uh, um, Greg and Kathy Pearson's home, and many of you were there, but some of you weren't, so I figured we'd get them their baptism certificates today, and those are things you may want to keep because uh, someday in the future you may need to know when you were baptized. But let's give them a round of applause for getting baptized. You guys can go ahead, go ahead and have a seat. We will hand out the rest of these when I catch those folks. Well, if you didn't grab one, on the Welcome Center is uh, the bulletins. They're also available online. There's information in there for you to stay up to speed with what's going on here at Glory. We, of course, have our Wednesday evening programming going for our students, and we have a family meal offered every Wednesday night. That's a free meal, um, a meal that you can come whether or not you have kids. Maybe you don't want to do dishes that night. Maybe you don't feel like cooking that night. Maybe you just want to spend some time with people that night. Come on here to glory and we will fill you full of food. And um, a note with that, there is oftentimes a little bit of food left over at the end of those meals. We send that home with people. And so if uh, you would like some, this week we had, it was kind of like a, I'll call it a tater taco hot dish, a tater tot taco meat, hot dish kind of thing. Um, and, and if you wanted some of that to go home, and I know uh, some of that went to my family, um, if you wanted some of that, there's usually a little bit left over. We're going to be sticking that in the fridge just to make sure for food safety and protection things. So before you leave on Wednesday night, stick your head in the fridge, check that out, and grab some of those containers and take that with you. But uh, it is there for the taking. Outside of that, inside your bulletins, lots of other informational items. Remind you, Sunday school has started. We have an adult Sunday school. Donna is leading our adult Sunday school and uh, would encourage you to give that a try this year. Stick your head in there. The deal is with spiritual growth, growth doesn't happen by accident. You've got to be intentional. So get plugged in, whether it's in a, a Bible study or a Sunday school class, or, or maybe you want to start up a small group, or, or do something to be intentionally connected with other Christians so that you are growing with others. Because as I said, again, that doesn't happen by accident. We need to be intentional about that. And so would challenge you to be part of that as well. Other things going on throughout this coming week, whether it's uh, quilting or we have trustee meetings or women's ministry meetings and other things, encourage you to read those bulletins. The last thing I want to highlight out of the bulletin is that next Sunday, following worship, we're going to go into the upper room with those who might have an interest in possibly becoming members here at Glory Baptist Church. Now, you're, if you're not a member, you are invited to come to this. My intention is I'm going to pick up a few pies and some Cool Whip, so we'll, we'll bribe you with some pie and Cool Whip. How about that? And we're going to have some pie. We're going to have 
uh, a good time. Our deacons and deaconesses will be there. I'll be there. And it'll be a chance for you to ask some questions about the church, for us to get to know you maybe a little bit more, and, and to, uh, to kind of go through the beginning of that interview process of becoming a member. And then uh, if you decide that you want to become a member, and then we can finalize all those details from that point forward. If you can't make that meeting, contact myself, contact Greg Pearson, and we'll make sure we get that scheduled with the deacons and deaconesses uh, to meet with you individually at some point down the road. Now, if you were just recently baptized, like we saw some of the folks who were here up here, um, you've already completed most of that process. And so it's an easy next step then to become a full member here at Glory. I would encourage you to do that. Membership, of course, means you get to vote. But uh, membership is also a personal commitment saying, yep, I like these people, I like this place, and I like the direction it's going, and I'm going to commit myself to being part of what God is doing there. So I would encourage you to be part of that and join with us on that. Well, with that, we're going to sing. We're going to make a joyful noise. We've got Sherry on the piano. We've got a bunch of folks coming up to sing. As they make their way up here, I would invite you as well to join in with your voice, to stand and sing and make a joyful noise. It doesn't matter if you sing well, just sing loud. Make a joyful noise and rejoice. Let us praise God together. I am not skilled to understand. What God has willed, what God has planned, I only know at His right hand, since one who is my Savior. Father, we come to you this morning with reverence for your greatness, and we worshipfully stand in front of you for who you are. We praise you. You alone are worthy of our praise and adoration. You are worthy of praise at all times and in all circumstances because you are always good, 
always trustworthy, always loving, always sovereign. Father, you have determined the number of the stars. You have given to all of them their names. Great are you, Lord, and abundant in power. Your understanding is beyond measure. Father, you've created and uphold the universe, and yet not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from you. Not one tiny sparrow is forgotten by you. We praise you, Father, who so loved the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Father, you did not send your Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we have been saved by your precious blood, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To you, God, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, his gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns or calls me home. Forgive. 
family. If you uh, look at your bulletin and this week's call to prayer, um, you'll see uh, Kenny and Beulah Westvig are our family of the week, so I'll be praying for them as the Lord brings them to mind. And uh, a couple other prayer requests to add to our glory family and those we care about. Um, Zach Enstrom is a, a football player for Aiken High School who was injured in the game and taken away by ambulance during the game, so just be praying for him in his recovery. And then we also want to be lifting up uh, Jacqueline. She is a, a colleague of uh, Carl's that's working um, with Bible translation overseas. She um, had an infection out in the field and had to have surgery out there because she had COVID and couldn't come back to a, a, a more modern hospital and she is suffering some possible infections. So just be praying that the Lord um, brings healing there and that the, the work of getting God's work and word out to these 
um, remote peoples will continue. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can freely gather together here and worship you, and that we can sing about your great hope that you give us. In you alone is our hope, Lord. Uh, before we knew you, there was no hope. But on the cross, you took the wrath that was intended for us. You also satisfied all the righteous requirements of your law for us. So that whoever is in you now, Lord, there is no condemnation. We thank you for the hope that that gives us now. So you've called us into your kingdom to do good deeds. And Lord, we thank you for the hope it gives us in the future where you will return and make all things right. Make all things new where there will be no more pain and suffering. So Lord, uh, we ask that you would remind our brothers and sisters of that hope, remind us of that hope, uh, especially for those who are dealing with sickness, Lord, who are dealing with death, who are dealing with uh, not knowing uh, what, what you have in store for them and a sense of um, uh, unfoundedness, Lord. And Lord, we uh, ask that you would be with our brothers and sisters who are right now dealing with persecution, um, that you would give them the hope of your gospel. We ask that you'd be with our brothers and sisters uh, that are facing war, especially in Ukraine right now, that they would be reminded of the hope they have in your kingdom, Lord, while their country is uh, in ruins. And Lord, we thank you for today that we can hear from you through your word preached. We ask that you would fill Pastor Chris with your Holy Spirit so that he can deliver it with power. And we ask that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can receive it gladly, uh, hearing uh, your truth and seeing your beauty. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are dismissed if they would like to go to the nursery. If you are uh, ages five and under, there is an age appropriate program and some snacks and activities and a, a little Bible lesson for you there in the nursery. So go ahead and head on in there today. If you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in the book of Romans, Romans 15 today. So uh, feel free to open to that. Use your phones, your iPhones, your iPads, whatever you got, Android. Uh, otherwise, underneath in some of the chairs are Bibles. And on the Welcome Center are Bibles as well. Uh, one other thing I do want to quickly point out is um, we made the announcement last week that we are going to be sending a shipping container to Ukraine, and we need your warm weather gear for that. We need hats, mittens, scarves, gloves, uh, coats, warm shirts, linens, sleeping bags, things like that. Our ladies have already donated a, a bunch of quilts that we'll be sending over. The reason I'm re-mentioning this is because the, the timeline has accelerated a little bit. We thought we had until Wednesday. We don't. We only have until next Sunday in order to get those items in. They've already begun to be collected. There's a, a, a little space in the upper room where you'll see some of those things collected. And so if you want to contribute to the stuff that's being sent to the Ukraine, uh, do get that in uh, before the end of the day next Sunday so that we can get all that boxed up and then it's got to go down to the Twin Cities where it's uh, collected with everyone else and put in the shipping container and then sent on to Ukraine. And so uh, thank you already ahead of time for being a blessing to that. Uh, we've, we've sent um, our, already this year, I think we sent one shipping container and we've sent a, a number of other blessings and, and both gifts and support and other things to Ukraine, to our sister churches there. We, of course, uh, support a sister church there in their summer uh, uh, VBS, I guess you want to call it. Um, they, they call them Bible camps or Bible schools, or Ruth will correct me with the right term, but, but um, they, they do them in, in a bunch of different areas, and now, this past year, with a whole bunch of people who don't normally live there having come into uh, where, where these churches are in Shilyaki and Pugachivka, Pugachivka, uh, I don't speak Ukraine, um, so when, when all of these people have been displaced in Eastern Europe, 
or Eastern Ukraine, they, they've kind of largely pooled near where our sister church is at. So they had the opportunity this summer to do some extra ministry there to, to reach out and to bless some students who, who weren't in their homes any longer. And so uh, we continue to pray for them. We continue to send support to them and encourage you to be part of that as well. Well, as I said, uh, we are in the book of Romans, and this is our final installment of our One Anothering series. And in this series, our focus has been on this biblical imperative to bear with one another, right? And that's, that's sort of big focus for today is the actual bearing with one another. Now, as I studied this week, I, I learned something new about the 59 one another's that we find in the Bible. Um, one third of them deal with unity in the church. Another third of them instruct us to love one another. And, and glory as a church will be united to the extent that we are able to do that, to love one another. And as I read through things this week, Uh, It led me to ponder one pastor's perspective, and he said, the primary activity of the church was one anothering one another for the early church back in the book of Acts. And as we've been learning, and and, and many of us have experienced firsthand, relationships aren't always easy, right? Relationships have an ebb and flow, and and, and at times uh, they go good, and at times they go bad, and and they can be fragile things that, that we can rupture. And if we don't work at it, yeah, our idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies, today is not a good day for my tongue apparently, our idiosyncrasies, our, our, our oddities, our individual uniqueness can actually be an irritant to others. And if we're not careful, that can cause our unity to unravel. That's why we have to be intentional about following the exhortation that we find in Ephesians 4.3, where it tells us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, my guess is, if we're truthful, there's some annoying people in your life. Quit elbowing the people next to you. It's not fair. But we all have somebody who's annoying in our life, right? Do you have any corrosive people. Maybe you've even got some corrosive Christians in your life. People who kind of eat away at your inside, right? Is there anybody in your life who kind of gets on your nerves a little bit? Do you have any sandpaper saints in your life that rub you a little bit the wrong way, right? In a book titled, People I Could Do Without, Donald Smith says, that our pent-up exasperation with people can send us into one of two different modes. We go into either a, a reactionary rampage or we go into a silent seethe. And it's no surprise then that the, the Bible would have quite a bit to say about how we need to go about bearing with one another. Now the phrase bear with means to, to endure patiently, to put up with, to be indulgent to or, or to suffer. And it has this idea of long-suffering, of being slow to anger. If you've ever read your Old Testament, you'll see all kinds of places where God was long-suffering and slow to anger with his people. That's where we find its very roots. But the truth of the matter is a lot of us are not particularly good at bearing with people who irritate us, right? We sound off, we run off, we run somebody else off. Sometimes we'll square off, sometimes we'll try to knock their heads off. But seldom do we put up with people. The phrase bear with occurs 17 different times in the New Testament. I like how the NASB captures it when Jesus says this to his disciples in Matthew 17, 17. He says, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long Shall I put up with you? In Ephesians 4.2, it gives us four different ways to cut a little bit of slack to one another. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. See, just from that little passage there, it's like a micro-sermon within this sermon. It, it tells us that we have to deal with our pride in humility, right? Always thinking that we're right and somebody else is wrong. That's not being humble. When we're humble, we'll put up with people. Because we know, if we're humble, that sometimes we're not always that easy to get along with ourselves, right? And then it says, be gentle. Be gentle with other believers. 
Be gentle with people who behave a little bit differently than we are. Recognizing how the God of grace deals gently with us. And then it says patience, right? When we're patient with others, we can see that they are in process just like we are. God isn't finished with me, and he's not done with you yet either. And then when we bear with one another, we're to do so with an attitude of love, as it says. Not an attitude of indifference, not an attitude of hate, hatred, but of love. Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. See, instead of being harsh with one another, we're called to be holy. We're called to be humble. We're to bear with those who bug us, if someone has done us wrong. And we're to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And the Bible tells us even those who've persecuted us. But before you can bear with someone, you may need to first forgive them. Forgive them for whatever they've done to you. Forbearing and forgiveness often go hand in hand. And this leads us to our main idea. Because Jesus bears with us, we then can bear with one another. We're called to put up with different personalities and different preferences and different perspectives within the body of Christ. Several weeks ago, I, I referenced the passage we're digging in on today here, Romans 15, 1 through 6, when we were exhorted to, to accept one another. And, and I want to go back to this text today because it, it deserved a closer look. And as we do, I think we'll see six different ways that we bear with people who bug us. And these will be the six points for your sermon, and they'll come up again in a little second. But it's to put up, to build up, to look up, to grow up, to stand up, and to speak up. Right? Lots of ups today. Now, as we read this passage in Romans 15, Paul is writing to two distinct groups of people in the church at Rome. He's writing to the weak and the strong, or as I referenced a few weeks ago, the weak and the weaker is probably a better statement, but he calls them the weak and the strong. And we see in this passage that each group within this church hate one another. The strong saints had no problem eating meat, sacrificed to idols, while others felt that by eating that meat that the person would become spiritually contaminated. And so that group follows a, a strict diet and felt that some days in the calendar were more holy than other days. And so these weaker believers, they, they, they believed that the stronger saints were, were, were out of bounds and that they were indulging in things that they shouldn't and they were violating the day of worship. And the other ones said, well, we got the freedom, we can do it. And they were in conflict. See, one group hadn't fully grasped the extent of their freedom in Christ, while the other exercised their freedom in Christ with a clear conscience, but didn't bear with other believers who disagreed. Which one of those groups was right in the Bible? Yes. They both were. Neither one was doing anything wrong in their beliefs. It was how were they living it out with one another. And we can easily fall into thinking that, that, that the way that we do things or our perspective is, is proper, it's right, and that those who differ from us, who, those who do things different from us, they, they must somehow be wrong, right? And some of us have this tendency to go out of our way to try to control other believers to, to believe and behave just exactly as we do secretly judging them according to our own personal spiritual standards, right? And we look down on the sins that are different than our sins, and we don't tend to look at our own sins. And in fact, if we were to pick which group do we fall into, most of us would probably say, yeah, oh yeah, we're, we're, I'm in the strong group that the Bible's talking about, right? We wouldn't categorize ourselves as a, a weak group person. And as we do that, as we think of ourselves in this way, we, we have to wonder, well, then why are so many other people weak and just like this tiny little group like me are strong? Now, I read it summarized as this this week, and I thought this was a good phrase. It says, an immature Christian is someone who has a PhD in others' sins and a junior high diploma in their own, right? Now, let me be clear on this. We're not asked to tolerate somebody's trespasses. Instead, 
We're called to give grace to those who are just wired a bit differently than we are. But here's the rub. The person who rubs me the wrong way may not be sinning against me, but I can easily sin against them with my own attitude and actions. So the first thing that we're called to do then, as I mentioned a moment ago, is to put up with people. Look at verse 1 there in Romans 15. It says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. See, the, the stronger believer, as I've already said, I think most of us would probably unintentionally categorize ourselves as, the, 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 the stronger believers are to bear up with the one who messes up. When Paul uses the word obligation, he's saying that we are bound by Christ to bear with one another. Now, we live in an age and in a culture that, that, that has a, what's called a cancel culture. Have you heard of this? It's probably been on the news. You've probably heard of it. We live in a cancel culture and in and, and, and a hypercritical world. And here the Bible is calling us to, to endure frustrations as we live closely with others in love. As we tolerate disputable matters as we've talked about before. Things that we can agree to disagree on but still be in the same church family. We have to put up with those personality quirks. And just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong, as we've talked about. We're challenged to restrain our own natural reaction towards odd or difficult people by just letting them be themselves without thinking that they need to become just like us. And not only are we to put up with people, but Romans here tells us that we're also to build one another up. Look at verse 2, Romans 15:2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to allow, or uh, to, to build him up. See, as we come alongside with one another, as we build one another up, we are thereby then used by God to help construct our fellow Christians, to help raise them up, to help build them up, to help strengthen them up. And then when we blast away at people, we willingly or unwillingly participate in the process of tearing them down. We're not just to endure with those around us, but instead we're to encourage them, to build them up, to raise them up. And our aim is, is to be a disciple-making group of people, a disciple-making church where, where everyone is being discipled and others are discipling one another. And in that process, we're raising each other up. We're raising the overall level. We are, we are elevating our spirituality together, being intentional to be with one another. You see, God is committed to building people up. And he's greatly grieved when we demolish what he designed. Isaiah 57, 14 says, Build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. We have to occasionally ask ourselves, am I being a help or a hindrance? See, God doesn't want us putting obstacles that stand in the way of someone else's growth. He longs for us to be builders of the body. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now part of building others up is recognizing that we, frankly, might be the irritant, right? This is where pearls come from. If you don't know about pearls, right? Pearls, you got this little bivalve mollusk, and it gets a tiny, tiny little piece of sand basically under its tongue, so to speak. I mean, it goes, mm, I don't like that. But you see, when you're a little bivalve on the bottom of the ocean floor, and you got a little piece of sand under your tongue, not a whole lot you can do about it, right? You don't have an arm that you can reach out, uh, kind of dig it out. They don't, they don't have toothpicks under the sea, right? SpongeBob isn't going to come by and clean it out. So their solution is to smooth it out. I put a coating on it, a protective coating. And then they keep putting a little bit more on. They keep putting a little bit more of it on, a little bit more of it on. And over time, it builds that up, right? And it takes something that was once an irritant 
and turns it into something majestic and valuable and beautiful. We are called to build others up. And if you are rubbing people the wrong way, acknowledge it. Try to quit being the irritant and allow them to help build you up as well. Now, we'll only put up and build up if we're looking up, your third, vote, your third up of the day. Notice in verse 3 in Romans 15, for there it says, For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell upon me. See, as we fix our eyes upon Jesus, we'll be reminded that, that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul quotes Psalm 69, 9 to show how Jesus embraced the insults of irritating people. He didn't please himself, and he took upon himself the reproaches, which were not his to bear, so that good could come to others. If you find yourself getting irritated and find yourself getting annoyed all the time, it's probably because you're not spending enough time looking up at Jesus. Look up at Jesus and remember that he puts up with you, right? And he bears up with you. And he's not freaking out because of you. If we lift our eyes to the cross, if we keep our focus on the Jesus, you'll be less prone to seeing the problems in other people. And if we're ever going to bear with one another, these people who are kind of like the porcupines in our lives, right? I don't know about you. Porcupines are interesting to watch, but you don't want to touch one, right? They're great from a distance, but up close, eh, not so much. And if we're ever going to learn to bear with those prickly people, we have to grow in our faith. And we grow by daily spending time in Scripture, we grow by being in a Bible study or in a Sunday school class or, or serving with one another, spending time with other Christians who, along with ourselves, help build one another up, doing so in community. Very, very, very infrequently do we grow at our best alone. God designed us for community. We need to be together to grow our best. Don't quote me on this, but your pastor said today you are all fertilizer for one another. You help each other grow, right? Leave it at that. Look at verse 4. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures that we might have hope. See, the Bible encourages us so that we can be filled with hope. Hope that others will change. And more importantly, honestly, hope that we can change. Do you read your Bible on a regular basis? Let me state this both simply and strongly. It's impossible to grow as a Christian if you're not allowing God's word to enter into your life. First Peter 2.2 links our growth to our spiritual diet. It says, like newborn infants, they long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. We begin to change when we soak ourselves in the Word of God. If you don't know where to start, if you've maybe never read your Bible, or maybe you just haven't read it with any regularity, every single week in your bulletin, Katie puts a Bible reading plan, new verses, something you could start on there. If you don't like those, go, go to the Bible app, version. They have tons of amazing, incredible Bible studies there that will lead you through the Bible. Pick a topic you're interested in. You want to know about, more about the parenting? Well, there's a Bible study there for parenting. You want to know more about whatever? I bet you there's a Bible study there for it. Bible studies for men, Bible studies for women, Bible studies for kids, Bible studies for people with bicycles and unicorns, and I don't know what. There's a Bible study for everybody. But you have to be intentional. Nobody's going to take your hand and walk you there. You have to choose to grow. So make that a goal if you haven't 
already. Spend some time in the Bible every day this week. Whether it's a couple of minutes at breakfast, whether it's listening to it as you drive down the road, whatever it is, find a way to plug yourself into God's Word. Now, since God bears with us, we also must be willing to stand up for those who've fallen down or who are just different from us. So number five is stand up. Look at verse five in Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. See, God's heart for the church is for us to be united and to stand together. And according to Acts 4.32, it says, Now the, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Right? I know I've made mistakes, right? I've been one of those people who've made poor conclusions about people. You ever met somebody and just kind of made that snap judgment about them, right? They walked in and you're like, oh, I'm not going to like this person, right? Any, anybody else ever done that? And then found them actually to be somebody you turned out to really like? Yeah, I've made those mistakes. I've judged somebody. I, I looked at them, didn't like the way they dressed, or <sighs> they walked in with a Packers shirt on. Oh. Man, I don't know where this is going to go, but I don't have a lot of hope. I have friends. I have a brother who's a Packers fan. And I love my brother. He's a good guy. So occasionally we make snap decisions and judgments about others that are unfair, and it's not something we should do. We prejudge them. We see people who are different from us, and a lot of times our filter says, that's bad. But as I've said, and I'll say it again, different doesn't mean wrong. Sometimes we need to get to know that person. Maybe that Packers shirt is an air tent, right? Okay. Maybe I can turn that into a bonding thing. I'm going to tease him about being a, Vi a Packers fan. He's going to tease me about being a Vikings fan. We're going to grow. We're going to have fun about it, right? That actually can make a friendship grow, that little irritant. So we need to learn to cut one another's a little bit of slack. Because the truth of the matter is, we seldom have the whole story. And that brings us to the final point, that the ultimate goal or the reason that we are to bear with one another is so that we can bring glory to God. The point is to speak up. Look at verse 6. That together you may with one another, with one voice, glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See that phrase there, with one voice, means with one accord, right? Together with one another. It's that one anothering we've been talking about for weeks now. And, and it's only possible to do this when we don't have strife with one another. We can't be joined together in one voice when we're fighting with one another, right? When we allow other believers to bug us, then our worship becomes short-circuited and our service becomes splintered and it damages our witness to a lost and hurting world. So how do we put this into practice then, Pastor? Well, here's what I would recommend you do. Make a list of people who bug you. Don't share it with the people who bug you. Just make a list of them, right? And when you are done making that list, hopefully it doesn't take more than a sheet of paper, but when you are done making that list of people who bug you, look through those names. Look through those people. Think, is there some common denominator here Things that bug you, right? Are there some traits, are there some attitudes that, that annoy you? And then ask God to, to help you see people from his perspective. And then the second step of that process, begin to pray for that list of people. Pray for them for two weeks. I challenge you. Make a list of people who annoy you and pray for them for two weeks. Because 
I will guarantee you at the end of those two weeks, your relationship with those people who irritate you could be radically different if you would just pray for them for two straight weeks, for the next 14 days. Pray for them. And then third, ask God to change you. As hard as I might try, I can't change anyone else, right? The problem often isn't other people. The problem is often personal, and we just don't like to admit it. Oftentimes, the problem is me. So I need to ask God to change me. God, do something about it with the one I can change. The fourth thing that we can do is we can learn to, to, to let go of grudges, to forgive faults. See, when people irritate us, when we hold a grudge against them, more often than not, it doesn't impact them in any way. And we walk around with this baggage on our back now, right? Remember me talking about those parents going through the airport, dragging behind them case after case after case, and how challenging that can be? It's a load. It's a pressure. And if you're carrying a bunch of baggage with you everywhere you go, it affects you in every other relationship. At some point, you got to get rid of that baggage. Give up those grudges. Forgive the faults. Release your grip on it, or it will hold you back and it'll hold you down. Is there someone you haven't forgiven? Maybe today is the day, the time to let that go. And then restore the broken relationship for your fifth step in this process. What is one positive step that you could take this week to mend a fractured relationship? Do you need to make a call? Do you need to send them a note? Do you need to go knock on their door or pay them back in some way, in a positive way, not a negative way? Because that gives me the sixth point. Perform an act of service. Loving feelings tend to follow loving actions. If you are waiting for your feelings to change, you might wait an awfully long time. C.S. Lewis has a great quote on this. He says, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, Lewis says, we find out one of life's great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. So if there's somebody in your life who's an irritant, find a way to serve them, love them, be a blessing to them. And I guarantee God will help you love them more. Because in the end, Jesus bears with each and every one of us. And aren't you glad that he does? And if he can bear with me, then I can certainly bear with you. Bear with one another. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you for bearing with all of us in our times where we have unbearable attitudes and actions. More than that, Jesus, we, we thank you for bearing our sins, that you took upon yourself our mistakes, our failures, when you didn't have to, you didn't deserve it, we did, but yet you'd gladly take it upon yourself as a way to show love. Lord, if we can love others in a similar way, that we can put up with them, that we can bear up with them. Show us that way, Lord, that through that we might be strengthened, through that it might raise all of us higher spiritually. And God, as we come to the communion table today, it is our intent to be united as one in heart and mind and soul and goal. God, I pray for our unity, our unity as individuals, our unity as families, our unity as a church, and then on into the world, Lord. May we be a blessing as a people of peace seeking to reconcile, to love, to bless, and to serve, as you did so for us. 
God, indeed, we are humbled and amazed that you would do this for us again and again and again. We thank you for bearing with us. Lord, show us the way this week to bear with one another. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is a communion Sunday. And uh, what we will do is pass the communion elements here in a moment. But I want to give a little bit of a special portion of notice or instruction here as I move down. You'll see these are a little bit different. And I'll throw a couple of these into each uh, tray. These are gluten-free ones because we do have a few people in our, our midst that, that live on a gluten-free diet. We would ask that you don't take these unless you're on a gluten-free diet because there's a limited supply of these. Uh, but if you are gluten-free, we do now have that for you. So that is an option. And they're pretty obvious because they look very different than our normal communion cups. And they say gluten-free, okay? That if you take it, it's not the end of the world, but ideally leave it for those who do need it and we'll stick a few in there. What we'll do is we'll pass the elements around and then we'll take them together. I'll, I'll say a few words and then we'll pray over them. And uh, while the elements are being passed, Sherry's gonna play. And I would invite you just to spend a few minutes to begin thinking about that list of people that you need to bear with, that people who irritate you. Begin to think about them and even now begin to pray for them and begin to pray that God would begin to work in your heart as well, that we might be united as we bear with one another.
The Bible recounts these words for us in 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul writes there, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Now, speaking of bearing with one another in the time of communion, this very act, Jesus instituting communion, came upon the time at which he was bearing very much with some of his followers. If you know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, His followers fall asleep instead of standing watch and praying. If you know the story, Peter denies him three times before the rooster crows, but he bears with him nonetheless. You see, Jesus bears with us because he loves us. And if he can bear with us and love us, then so should we with others. As we take the communion today, let us do so with our hearts and mind joined together. Let us pray and then we'll take the bread. Lord, we thank you again that you bear with us. We thank you for this reminder of your body broken on our behalf. And God, may we be people of peace, seeking to be reconciled, seeking to forgive, seeking to bear with one another as you have done so with us. Jesus, thank you for this great reminder of your abundant and amazing love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let us take and eat. And as we look at the cup here, and we see the, the vibrant, deep red that reminds us of the blood that was shed. When we bear with one another, there can be a cost. It isn't always easy. There is pain involved. But Jesus bore it for you. So I would challenge you to do the same for others in your life as well. May Jesus' love always be an abundant blessing as he bears with us. Amen. Let us take and drink. Well, you have your homework for the week. Go and bear with one another and find ways to be a blessing to one another. Find ways to move past your hurts and your harms. And as you do so, do it to the glory of God as you serve your king. As you leave, our deacons will be collecting for the deacons fund. All the funds that are given to this is money that we give away to be a blessing to others in both times of need and just as an encouragement. So as the Lord leads, would invite you uh, to give to that as you see fit. Once again, thank you for taking some time out of your weekend. Go and serve your king. And if it's still on TV, cheer for the Vikings. Amen. Amen.